dear friends of the faculty, dear colleagues, dear students, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Francois Crepeau and I'm the director of the McGill Center for Human Rights and Legal Pluralism. Our Dean, Professor Robert Lecky, regrets very much not being able to be with us on this occasion. In his absence, it is an honor for me to welcome you all at the Faculty of Law of McGill University for the 2019 Robert S. Litvak Award and Lecture. In the life of a law school, an award and a named lecture such as these are the occasion to celebrate the achievements of a number of persons. First, it is an exercise in collective memory. We celebrate the memory and the achievements of the person whose name is attached to the award and the lecture. Maître Robert S. Litvak, a graduate of our faculty of 1963, was a passionate advocate for human rights and the rule of law, and he won a number of cases on Aboriginal rights and linguistic rights, which have set the course for today's constitutional order in Canada. I was living in Cree communities in the summers of 1980 and 81, and these communities were being boosted politically, financially, culturally, and spiritually, thanks to the tripartite 1975 James Bay Agreement, which Maître Litvak negotiated on behalf of the Inuits with the um, First Nations, with the Quebec government, and with the federal government. We're honored to have among us today Maître Sylvia Litvak, also a graduate of our faculty and the widow of Robert S. Litvak, as well as Ms. Gabriela Siegel, their granddaughter, who will soon graduate from NYU Law School, another good law school. Sylvia has been a great friend of this faculty over the past three decades, very committed to creating a community of human rights lawyers, advocates, and defenders. Second, the award provides an opportunity to recognize a person who has made a difference in the world thanks to their advocacy and defense of human rights and the rule of law. This year, we honor Mr. Denise Yussel, a German-Turkish journalist who has paid a heavy price in defending the freedom of the press and freedom of information. Sylvia and Gabriela will recount the history of the Litvak Award, will introduce the recipient, and will present him with the award. Third, this is the occasion to welcome a distinguished colleague for a memorable lecture on the human rights issue recognized by the award. Today, we're welcoming our colleague, Professor David Kay of UC Irvine. His mandate as United Nations Special Rapporteur on the promotion and protection of the right to freedom of opinion and expression is exemplary, and his thematic and country reports contribute greatly to increasing our knowledge on these issues, clarifying their conceptual framework, and enhancing our sense of urgency in the protection of these essential freedoms in such times of nationalist populism. The concluding remarks will be pronounced by Mr. Faisal Ok, who is Mr. Yusuf's lawyer in his fight against the Turkish authorities and helped him making a free man again. For those of you who would want to hear more from Mr. Ok, there is a public dialogue uh, organized between him and our colleague, Professor René Provo, tomorrow at 11.30 a.m. in room 609. The biographies of Denise Yussel, David Kay, and Vesel Ock are in the program. We have a very tight schedule as there's a class in this room at 2.30, so we'll be kicked out. I therefore urge all speakers to please respect the time they've been allotted. I now invite Sylvia Litvak and Gabrielle Siegel to address you. Monsieur le directeur, chers collègues, chers amis, c'est avec un plaisir toujours renouvelé que je reviens à McGill, mon alma mater et celle de mon mari Robert Litvak. Voilà maintenant 32 ans que je fais ce pèlerinage pour les remises de prix à sa mémoire. Je vous remercie d'être venu à nouveau. Vous allez rencontrer une personne exceptionnelle, le journaliste Denise Youssel, qui reçoit aujourd'hui le prix dédié à la mémoire de mon mari. It is a sobering thought that we are gathered here today to honor brave journalists in the context of an award that was created to support the rule of law. When this, these nominees were chosen, 
we did not yet know the horrific Khashoggi murder was to happen soon afterwards, and that continuing pressures on the lives of and freedoms of journalists everywhere would be unrelenting. What we did know is that there can be no rule of law without respect for the freedom of the press, and the rule of law is what this award is all about. For some of you who have been faithfully returning for over 30 years, you know what this award stands for. But for many of you, the young people here, who are the hope of a better future, let me say briefly how and why it was created. In 1987, my husband Robert Lidvak, a Montreal lawyer, died while still a young man, but not before he had achieved some remarkable milestones in Canadian human rights history. Quite by accident, while engaged in ordinary civil law practice, like many of you aspire to, he was drawn in the early 70s by his sense of justice to represent pro bono the Inuit of Northern Quebec in a then unprecedented lawsuit in Canadian legal history along with other First Nations. The Quebec government of the day had decided to build a massive hydroelectric project, the James Bay Dam, over their territory without any prior consultation, ignoring both their immemorial rights over the land and also the massive environmental damage to follow. In that respect, we should remember that practice has not disappeared nearly 50 years later, and that First Nations still have to battle in courts to defend their lands against tar sands pipelines and environmental destruction. En français, on dit, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. Back in the 70s, many experts on the damage to wildlife, as well as the existential threat to the Aboriginal way of life, donated their time, the project was halted in a landmark judgment, a settlement was negotiated for the first time with the First Nations sitting at the table as equals, and legal history was made. Later on, having developed a taste for taking the fight to governments when they ignored or trampled on their citizens' rights, Robert launched and won a constitutional court challenge to protect both the French and the English language rights in Quebec. This did not endear him to everyone. <laughs> and I vividly, vividly, vividly remember, but I have to find the page first. I vividly remember one very angry woman shouting into the telephone at 3 a.m., Vive le Québec libre, Monsieur l'avocat Litvac. To which Bob replied, still half asleep, Mais vive tout le monde libre, madame. <laughs> it was Bob's way to diffuse anger and intolerance wherever he encountered it with humor and understanding. He was without a doubt the person I most admired in my life. When he died in March 1987, after a short battle with cancer, McGill Law School established an award in his memory to be given every few years to someone who fought for the recognition of the rule of law against arbitrary power. Over the past 32 years, it has been awarded to an impressive array of brave individuals of all creeds and convictions, but who all put their passionate beliefs ahead of their own safety. They came from Chile, Canadian native lands, East Jerusalem, the US, Egypt, Sri Lanka, and Pakistan, to recall only a few. This year, I will not be presenting the award to our nominees. That honor will go to my granddaughter, Gabriella, who will tell you why they were chosen. She's well qualified to do so, not only because she will be graduating from NYU Law School this spring, but mostly because from a tender age, she has worked in Lebanese refugee camps to provide legal services to Palestinian and later Syrian families displaced by the war, and she is now working in New York to defend immigrant rights. So she's no stranger to the defense of human rights, and it is with great pleasure that I pass the torch to her and tell her how proud her grandfather would be to see her here. So this is Gabriella, my granddaughter. I'm a little taller. <laughs> a lot taller. Um, merci beaucoup. C'est un grand, grand honneur d'assister à la remise de ce prix, uh, Mr. Eugène. 
It is a great honor to join my grandmother here today and present this award to Mr. Deniz Yücel. Mr. Deniz Yücel is a German-Turkish journalist and producer who became a target of the Turkish government through his critical reporting on sensitive topics such as the Kurdish issue, the Syrian war, and hack documents. As Mr. Yücel is accepting this award on behalf of several other journalists and all threatened in silence, Turkish voices, I wanted to take a few moments to give you some background, uh, not only on his work, uh, but the context journalists like him have been facing in Turkey and the types of legal challenges his lawyer, who's joined us here today, Mr. Ok, um, have been battling. In 2016, in just the first three months of what would ultimately be a two-year-long state of emergency following the failed military coup, uh, the Turkish government ordered the closure of 102 media outlets, including 45 newspapers, 16 TV channels, three news agencies, 23 radio stations, 15 magazines, and 29 publishing houses. Arrest warrants were issued for more than 100 journalists, hundreds of government-issued press accreditations were canceled, and an unknown number of journalists had their passports revoked, making it impossible for them to leave the country and report abroad. In this time, well over 2,300 journalists and media workers lost their jobs, and over 50 were arrested within just the first few months, all to devastating effect on Turkish freedom of expression and freedom of press. The Turkish government insisted these measures were justified for security reasons and claimed journalists in jail were being investigated or prosecuted for possible criminal activities, but rights groups monitoring the situation disagreed, pointing to the extremely close relationship between the judiciary and the government as the judiciary was increasingly taken over by government appointees. All of this, again, to the great de detriment of Turkish freedom of press. In August 2016, an Istanbul court ordered the temporary closure of Özgür Gündem, a pro-Kurdish daily with a circulation of 7,500, after ruling that the paper acted as a de facto news outlet for the outlawed Kurdistan Workers' Party, police stormed the offices and detained 24 people, of whom 22 were later released. In February 2017, Turkish authorities detained Mr. Yücel after he reported on emails that a leftist hacker collective had purportedly obtained from the private account of Berat al Bayrak, who happened also to be not only the Turkish energy minister, but also the son-in-law of the president of Turkey. An Istanbul court ordered Mr. Yücel to be jailed pending his, tri his trial, and he was uh, in total held for 10 months. He was the first foreign reporter to be held in the context of these crackdowns in Turkey, and his attention uh, due to his uh, foreign status attracted a great deal of public and diplomatic interest. Ultimately, uh, despite being detained for over 10 months, he was released following pressure from the Turkish government and the international community and uh, was able to leave the country, but not, bo not before swinging by his Istanbul home to pick up his beloved cat, who was also the beneficiary of Germany's diplomatic efforts. <laughs> it goes without saying that this kind of journalism is essential to the proper functioning of any civil society, and the work of journalists like Mr. Yuzha and the tireless efforts of lawyers like Mr. Ock are critical in supporting not only freedom of speech, but all efforts to organize politically for our civil, social, cultural, and human rights. And with that, it is our great honor to present this award to Mr. Dennis Yuzha. invite Mr. Uchel to address you. PowerPoint. Thank you. How to continue? For me? Just to Before, ah, okay. So, hello. I try to keep the time. Um, it, it, is a, it is a big honor to, to, to be here with you. Uh, dear David, dear Sylvia, thanks a lot for your nice introduction and uh, it's I mean it's great to get one award after the other just for uh, for doing nothing but sitting stupid in a jail so that was the most the most thing that I've uh, uh, um, 
uh, do for one year, but um, uh, uh, yes, and with doing nothing, just sitting in the in the jail, I uh, heard earned a lot of awards. One of the, just the first one in the overseas. Thanks a lot. That's a big honor. And before I came here, I, I thought about uh, preparing a lecture about human rights and freedom of press and why it is so important for democracy. And then later I decided, no, these are things that you, or all of you, knows better than me, especially David can talk much better about these things than I can. So uh, let me, uh, I thought maybe it's better to, to sh tell you my story about uh, what happened to me, um, and it's maybe also interesting for you. So um, I was, I started in, I was working in Germany as a journalist for many years. Uh, I was born in Germany as a uh, children of Turkish working immigrants, and my last newspaper I was working for was Taz, the Tageszeitung, which is a left-wing newspaper, and I was working as columnist and uh, front-page editor, not as a reporter on the ground, and I had nothing to do with Turkey. And then these things happen. This is the Gezi, the beginning of the Gezi protest in 2013. And, uh, and I thought it's so interesting what's happening there. So I go to, to Turkey only for sea for a few days. That's what, that was the plan. And then I stay for half a year, uh, make some researches, publish the book. And uh, after one year later, the more conservative, that's me and the Gezi, uh, uh, offered me to go to Turkey as correspondent. So. Um, a few situations as a correspondent before I was arrested. This is at the Turkish-Syrian border with a, Tur with a journalist colleague. A few minutes after this picture was taken, um, we was uh, taken into the cost custody because the government of the uh, province had an, a press conference there. At the border, uh, we asked some questions. He didn't like the questions. Finished the press conference and uh, give the policeman the order to, uh, around him the order to uh, take us in custody. It was only for a few hours, not so, not so badly. That's another situation with uh, German Chancellor, uh, Chancellor Merkel and Ahmed Daoudoglu in Ankara. Uh, once again, situation, I'm asking a question, and after this I was not taken in custody, but I had to leave the country for a few weeks. And um, I mean, that's, that's uh, yes, and that's the morning of the Coup d'etat after a very hard and violent night waiting, that's at the airport in Istanbul, waiting for the speech of these men. Um, so only a few pictures from my nearly two years that I worked in, as correspondent in Turkey. And of course, I was working for a foreign press. But it was a, for a German newspaper. It was a very luxurious situation. Uh, uh, because they could not, they were not able, the government was not able to make pressure on my newspaper. Um, so it is uh, these things that happened to me, uh, asking pre uh, a question in a press conference and get it in custody or have to leave the country, is nothing uh, uh, in comparing to the situation of the Turkish colleagues. So, um, oh, yes, we come later to this, it's not so important. After uh, Gabriela has told the story, after uh, in the beginning of 2017, I go to police, uh, the police president in Istanbul because there was some uh, 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 investigation about these, these Berat Albayrak's emails. They put, take me in custody, and after two, two weeks in police custody, I was arrested by court, uh, by court in Istanbul, now not in cause of these uh, mails, but uh, in cause of my, uh, some articles which, uh, which have I had published in Die Welt, for example, this inter interview with this PKK leader, which was published one and a half year before. So this is Silivri, uh, the biggest um, uh, prison complex in whole Europe, in Turkey. In the, today's Turkey, we are proud of things like this, the biggest, the highest. It's easy to imagine what Sigmund Freud would uh, think about it. <laughs> and this is, this is the highest, biggest... Uh, um, it's a Libya complex, but it's, there are um, 10 prisons. One of these, number nine, is the, this is the big area, the main entrance, and this is the door of number nine. This is a kind of VIP prison for journalists, human rights activists. Um, yes, the, the guardians there say uh, it, is a, it is a VIP prison. And 
uh, where the VIP prisoners. So uh, there I spent uh, one year, the most of the time alone, completely alone, in isolation, which is a kind of, uh, of torture. And the most worst thing for me there was, you can see, um, these are some of the cells that are uh, for people uh, for, for um, staying alone, some cells for, for free. You've got this court courtyard, very small. You can uh, do some steps. But this picture is a little bit, is, is, an, is an older one. As I came to Silivri, they, um, they fixed a fence over the courtyard. So even if you stay outside, uh, it was not possible. You look, turn, turn your face to heaven, and uh, to forget for one moment where you are, it was not possible. So that was, for me, the hardest moment uh, in Silivri. And as I said, um, I was all the time alone. I think, uh, as far as I know, uh, there, was also, there was no prisoner in Silivri in that time uh, who had uh, a situation like this. Um, after a while, uh, they bring me to the to sp um, sport area. Also there I was alone, playing football, football by my own. I mean, okay, I've, I've, been, I've never lose a match, but so, and as uh, Gabriele said, as I was in prison without an indictment for one year, Turkish government began a campaign against me, the Turkish media, government uh, media, uh, and uh, Pre President Erdogan blamed me as terrorist and agent, German spy, things like this. And on the other side, in Germany, began a huge uh, solidarity, not only in Germany, but especially in Germany, uh, from my friends, from, uh, from colleagues, from my newspaper, from my former, former newspaper, from other media. It was really for the politicians in Germany, the government, and also the opposition. So uh, it, was, it was really important for me um, in that time when I was alone, staying in this isolation, to know that I'm not forgotten here. So... Um, and I'm very thankful for, for this uh, uh, solidarity. But um, I was not just staying there and doing nothing. Even my first article from, uh, that I've published from inside was uh, from police custody. There were no pencil allowed and no uh, paper were allowed. Uh, but books were allowed. And I, I had a big novel from Oğuz Atay, which is a great Turkish uh, novelist, 700 pages. Take this, try to take this as a paper, and the source, source of, um, uh, me, um, of the, uh, of the essence conserven. Uh, they give us to, to eat in, in conserves, in conserve, in tins, tins. And there was some kind of red sauce, and I took this sauce, tried to write with this, and use that book, but it was not, uh, it was not so easy. And after a while, I, I had a situation uh, to, s to see a pencil, and I steal this pencil. Now I had a pencil, but still not, uh, not paper, but I had a second book, and it was uh, Le Petit Prince. And I write my, the whole story, the situation in custody, how are the conditions, the, uh, uh, it is, no fresh air, we are all the time there inside, bad, uh, um, bad things to eat, and also, uh, those things. I write this in this uh, Petit Prince and give it to my lawyers in, in the back with uh, uh, used clothes, so we didn't notice it, and it was published in the time when I was in custody. And this experience was very exper um, important also for me for the, for the following time to see... Um, how difficult the situation ever is. It is all, all the time it's possible to resist, to find a way. There, are, there is a way. If it's not, if it's not allowed uh, uh, to use pencils, you use the source of the... And, and if it's cigarettes and smoking is not allowed, you get somehow uh, nicotine uh, um, pads. But you'll find a way. It is all the time. There is a way to resist. The point is not to be, uh, if you're in jail or not, the point if you're is if you surrender or not. That was uh, a big um, experience. That's a, that's a, I don't think that I can explain this thing. This is my, the origin of my cell, published by the Welt uh, after 300 days. These are the back pages of a newspaper, of the issue of the Welt. We printed one issue, I think 80 pages or something like this. The front page of the newspaper was normal front page, 
But if you turn around, it was a part of my cell. And this is the whole newspaper, you see, with the details. Uh, I've given that the details from, from inside. Uh, this was only for orientation for the, for the graphic. Also, of course, completely illeg illegal, but there is a way to uh, bring that out. And this is Mr. Gabriel, uh, Germany, Germany's foreign minister. He really fight a lot for me, but after a while, he said he was talking about uh, weapons for, for Turkey and said, as long as I'm in prison, it's not possible. And I made an interview, written interview by uh, the German uh, press agency, and I said, I won't be part of any kind of dirty deals. So he was not uh, amused, uh, Mr. Mr. Foreign, uh, the foreign minister of Germany. But, and at the end, I think uh, they captured me. They took me as, as a hostage, the Turkish government. They tried to um, uh, make some deals like give us some former, Gulen, uh, some former uh, uh, military officers that, that is uh, seeking for asylum in Germany, give us them and you can you, you take your journalists or whatever. But um, in the end, I think uh, I became uh, really a pain in the ass for mm -hmm. this Turkish government and they really wanted to, uh, uh, to kick me out. So uh, it is for someone uh, staying in, in, in prison uh, alone, I think it's not such a bad success, but it is, of course, a success um, which was which was possible with a lot of support of many, many people, of my friends, of my sister, my, my wife, my colleagues, and that guy, that's my wife, this guy, Veselok. Veselok, once a Turkish diplomat says, make it, it says in an interview, even the Pope can't uh, release Dennis. No one can help him, even the Pope can't help him. Can help him. So Basil tried to help that guy who the Pope con could not help. So it, is, it was a hard job, and it was also dangerous for him, as for, all, for other lawyers in, in, in Turkey. There are not only journalists and media workers in prison. There are um, more than 500 uh, lawyers in Turkey in, in prison, and I think the... Uh, outside from Turkey, mostly talking about uh, journalists and media workers, and of course it's important to talk about these people, but it's also important uh, to see at the lawyers, to your colleagues maybe, uh, because they are doing a really a great job, and, and that guy ma made a fantastic job. He was not only um, he was not only my lawyer and my friend, sometimes we, was, we were uh, sitting together in this small glass cabins, talking for four, five hours. And he said, after five hours, I've got to go out to the toilet. And I said, no, come on, wait. You can go later to the toilet, <laughs> stay here. And he stayed. And, and he was, um, even many, many people supported me. We had sometimes we had discussions, we had some conflicts with, uh, with my friends, with my newspaper, uh, with my wife. Uh, mostly we discussed about the, real, uh, the, the, the correct strategy. So and, and, and usually they wanted to be more careful, and I wanted to be more attack and the next attack and starting the next. Uh, 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 and and uh, in all of uh, these discussions, Vesel was the moderator. He, w he became our family therapist. Mm -hmm. I think without Vesel, uh, Dilek and me would uh, divorce in that time. He became our uh, family therapist. And at the end, he made this picture. So he became our photographer as, as well. That's the moment of my release with Dilek, with my wife. And uh, I don't have the time to tell, the, to tell you, to explain you the story of this uh, parcel. Parcel, right? Parcel, parcel. it's in, in my hand. It's, it was a present for Dilek. Uh, shortly, what I wanted to say, it's um, uh, two things. Uh, one point is, if you uh, talk about people in prison, journalists in prison, intellectuals, uh, human rights activists, people who are, have nothing done, anything else but uh, uh, fighting for uh, 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 human rights, uh, don't see them all just uh, as victims. It's all the time it's possible to, to, to resist against, uh, uh, also against uh, dictatorial regimes, and especially that authoritarian regimes of the 21st century, today's uh, uh, um, regimes, they 
have to be try to pretend there is something like a uh, rule of law. Of course, it, it's not, but 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 we, but we uh, um, pretend as if it, if, uh, if it were, if it were, and it's. Uh, Yes, it's one thing. It's you can all the time how it's difficult the situation is. Um, you can't resist. It's one point, and the other point is um, you can't do it if you are completely alone. So um, you need uh, people who uh, friends of you, people who love you, people or even people who don't uh, don't like you or even have never heard about you. But if uh, to, to understand that. Um, that uh, that that problem we have in t that we have in Turkey at the moment it's not only in Turkey it's a global situation and uh, uh, to, to to stand up against this and um, that's that's uh, sorry um, yes that's important and no one in prison can resist if he's completely alone so uh, that's why I'm uh, very f uh, thankful for all the support that I had. Uh, uh, from all over the world, but especially, uh, of course, from Germany, and especially from that guy. And I think um, for the Litbock Award, he would be the better candidate <laughs> than me. Maybe, maybe the next time. Thanks a lot for it. Um, <laughs> and I hope you could understand me. Uh, sorry for my English. It's, I wish it would be better, but it is like it is. Okay. And I'm not too late. Huh? I'm not, not too late. late. No, no, you want time. Yeah. <laughs> you make so much pressure that I completely lost my my my, my, my speech because I was so afraid of him. He's <laughs> like a like a te football technique director. You've got ex 14 minutes. He said 14 in them. That's good. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. After this testimony, Professor David Kay. I won't be uh, offending. Great, thank you so much. I, I want to start. Um, I want to start first of all by thanking the Litvak family for for supporting this uh, this program and for supporting these awards. I think it's absolutely essential, and I'm going to actually start because I also am scared of Professor Krepo, and so I'm going to put on my timer. Um, but I think it's essential to to support this kind of work and to support the acknowledgement of what people like Denise and Basel are doing. And it's not only because of the work that they do and the pressures that they face in their countries, but also because of what they are doing isn't only about themselves. And I think um, Denise downplayed this to a certain extent. The work of journalism isn't just because Denise likes to write, although maybe it's partly because you like to write and hopefully you like to write, but it's also because it's about what we as an audience, what we as a public have a right to receive. We have a right to receive the information that Denis and other journalists in Turkey or writers in Turkey or anywhere around the world uh, collect and disseminate for us. And so in a way, they suffer for the kind of information that we require in order to be public citizens, to be global citizens. And so I think acknowledging that up front is, is essential. Um, I also want to thank the faculty at McGill University for, uh, for inviting me to, to be here today. It's really quite an honor. So I want to, um, I'm going to start with a few examples of situations just to give you a little bit of a setup for what, what the subject of my talk will be. And I want to start with, with really brief uh, descriptions of a few people and a few circumstances. So the first here is Carmen Aristegui. She is one of the most well-known journalists in Mexico. Uh, she, she's both independent and for years was associated with, with CNN in Mexico as well. And, um, and she reflects a lot of what I think Turkey has pioneered in, um, 
but she experienced this in Mexico. So uh, if anybody saw 60 Minutes, I don't know if 60 Minutes shows regularly in Canada. I'm from California, so, uh, and I don't watch 60 Minutes either, so if you don't. Anyway, last night there was a program where they talked about um, basically private surveillance industry, the industry that essentially sells its wares, sells its, its software, sells its program, sells its tools to governments that will simply pay for it and they may use it in order to attack journalists, to monitor journalists, to monitor activists, in the case of Mexico, even to monitor uh, UN workers, United Nations um, investigators, and, and, and Carmen was targeted by exactly this kind of software. So this Israeli company, NSO Group, sold the software known as Pegasus to Mexico to a variety of Mexican government uh, entities, both the central government and around the country to different states and municipalities and law enforcement. And they in turn use those tools in order to infect the phone, the smartphone, not only of Carmen, but also her son, who is uh, a minor under 18 years old, uh, and to track their movements and to track exactly who they were connected with around the world, right? And uh, in particular in Mexico. So this is this is one of the situations that we identify and should shout out to a Canadian organization, Citizen Lab at University of Toronto, that actually was able to identify this as a particular problem in Mexico. Carmen isn't alone. She is representative, really, not only of what's happened in Mexico to journalists and to activists, but also to others around the world, including in Turkey. The second is something called Bylock, which uh, our Turkish friends will know very well. So Bylock was a particular tool that was used within Turkey, particularly within um, the civil service. So civil servants use this tool in order to give themselves a kind of uh, protection, a kind of confidentiality in their interactions online, right? And so Bylock was similar to, if you imagine, iMessage or something more sophisticated like Signal, right? It provided encrypted communications for people. It wasn't the best most secure system, but essentially it was used across um, Turkish government and elite society, including among judges, in order to communicate. Well, it became, after the coup attempt in July 2016, it became the example that the Turkish government would use in order to identify who was on the wrong side, who was a quote-unquote gulenist, who was supportive of the coup, the coup attempt. And so this particular tool... Was, which was used in order to protect the privacy of individuals communicating online, was also used as a tool by the government in order to essentially fire judges at a mass scale, fire, fire civil servants, fire um, teachers, uh, undermine journalism across the board. So this was bylock. This is, this is also a part of the discussion that I'll talk about today. And then the last, of course, is, is Twitter. Um, the page doesn't exist. Maybe you've come across this before where you've tried to reach a particular uh, tweet, a particular person on Twitter, and you found that their account has been disabled. They've been removed from Twitter for one reason or another. I'm going to talk a little bit about this situation as well, right? Because as we've seen the rise of private surveillance, as we've seen governments use tools in order to undermine privacy and security for individuals online, we've also seen governments attack social media platforms that have become fundamental ways for people to share information, including for journalists to share information, but also activists and others to identify with one another to build community. In the case of Turkey, in the case of India, in the case of many places around the world, governments actually make demands of Twitter, of YouTube, of Facebook, of other platforms uh, to remove content and to remove individual accounts, that is, individuals with very little oversight and very little uh, transparency. So I'm going to talk about those kinds of issues in my, in my talk today, and I'll, I'll try to stay with I will stay. I promise I will stay within time. And I want to talk about this in three contexts. So first I want to just talk a little bit about the context. This will be very similar um, to what Denise was talking about, the, but make it a little bit more global. So the global effort to restrict freedom of opinion and freedom of expression, it's a real global assault on expression. Second, I want to talk about the rise of digital space, but talk a little bit more about the specific kinds of attacks 
Um, and I'll try to keep that relatively, relatively brief, and, brief, and because I'm also not a technologist, I'm not a computer scientist, but I kind of play one on TV, I'll try to keep this very uh, um, non-technical in, in my description of the opportunities for abuse by, by governments. And then third, I wanna conclude with um, a call for us to reconceptualize how we think about law in this space. Um, so those are the three uh, sets of issues that I wanna talk about. I'm gonna start with, with context, and I'll, I'll go through context relatively quickly, but of course, um, I'm a law professor, so I gotta start with law, uh, and I wanna do this, uh, again, relatively briefly. For the purposes of my discussion, um, I'm going to put this all within the framework of international human rights law, right? So under international human rights law, particularly under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, there are two particular provisions that I wanna spend um, just a moment on in order to, to put you in the mindset of thinking about international human rights law rather than domestic law or ethics or any other framework uh, according to which we might think about these kinds of issues. So first is Article 17 of the ICCPR, which says no one shall be subjected to arbitrary or unlawful interference with his privacy. Um, it's his, it was drafted, adopted in 1966, so the language might not be as we would draft it today. But then it also says in paragraph two, everyone has the right to the protection of the law against such interference or attacks. This means that both governments have a responsibility not to interfere with privacy, but also that governments have a responsibility to protect us against third party interference with privacy. So I want us to think about right to privacy in part um, as a protection that government owes us from in the first order against their own um, attacks and also the protection that they provide to us. One part of the digital age that has become really essential for us to think about in terms of human rights law is that the right to privacy is very much connected to the right to freedom of opinion and expression, right? Because so much of our world, so much of our public space is now digital space. Our ability to engage in all sorts of dialogue, to engage in debate, depends on privacy. Right? And so we have to be connecting those things together. And to a certain extent, when we think about freedom of opinion and expression, we should also be thinking about not just in the, in the context of language that was really developed in the context of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in, in, in the late 1940s, but also in the current context today as we think about it. So Article 19, again, it provides briefly the right to freedom of opinion uh, which means the right to hold opinions without interference, right? There is no restriction that may be permitted on the right to freedom of opinion. Second, everyone has the right to, to freedom of expression. I tell my students, you might wanna just tattoo this somewhere um, because you should have it in your head all the time. It includes the right, and, and if we think about domestic law, whether it's in Canada or the United States, the language here, I think, is, um, is capacious it really enables us to think about expression not just as a right of speech. We tend to think of free speech as, as in a way, a kind of one-way street. But Article 19, Paragraph 2 says that everyone has the right to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas of all kinds. Seeking, receiving, imparting. That's, that's the world of expression. It's not just one way, it's two ways. And in the digital age, it's multiple ways that we get information. It's also regardless of frontiers. So it's, you know, uh, in law school, we might have uh, esoteric debates about the extraterritoriality of international human rights law. In Article 19 and the freedom of expression, there's a sense that actually it's already an extraterritorial right that one has. You have the right to seek information across boundaries. And then finally, it's um, through any media of one's choice. So there was this seed that was planted in the 1940s that regardless of how technology develops, this right will, um, will remain and will include, um, will retain its force. Now the last part of it, article, of Article 19 is 19.3, which provides states with the ability to restrict expression. Um, and and I'm, I'm afraid that generally, particularly when we look at what's happening in Turkey or anywhere else around the world, we see that that governments uh, regularly abuse Article 19.3. So Article 19.3, we talk about it as including three parts. It's a three-part test. 
It requires that any restriction be provided by law. We tend to think of that as regularly adopted law, but also not subject to, to such vagueness that I, as a person, or you as a person who's subject to the law, can't tell the difference between what's on the right side of the law and what's on the wrong side of the law. It requires a kind of precision and clarity. And much of this is discussed, by the way, in General Comment 34 of the Human Rights Committee, which goes into some depth onto some of these different issues. And I, I urge people, because this looks like very generic, high-level law, there is jurisprudence around this, and there's, there's discussion and commentary by the Human Rights Committee um, and by the European Court of Human Rights and the Inter-American Court of Human Rights that really provides some, some flesh to the bare bones here. That's the first, provided by law. The second is necessity. So any restriction must be necessary. We think of it as necessary and proportionate, and that is to achieve a legitimate government objective or to protect a government objective. So that might be respect of the rights or reputations of others, protection of national security or public order. National security and public order tend to be the, the examples that governments try to shove all of their restrictions under, um, or public health or morals. Uh, we could spend a whole seminar on public morals and what that might mean. We'll put that to the side for the moment. This is freedom of expression as it's uh, framed by international human rights law and by Article 19 in particular. Okay, so in thinking about context, we have the law, we have that legal background. Let me just say that the global assault on freedom of expression we see everywhere. I even used one of the same pictures that, that Denise used uh, here. So, um, so one is direct attacks on journalists, on writers, on artists, and, and on dissidents, regardless of the digital space. Right, so we see this in the context of individual journalists being detained, um, or as Gabrielle was, was discussing, uh, outlets being shuttered in Turkey, uh, websites being blocked around the world. We see these direct forms of attacks on journalists, writers, artists, and dissidents. We see it, of course, in the direct attacks on individuals through use of force, the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, um, in all likelihood with the blessing, if not the order, of the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. So we see these kinds of attacks, and one of the, the deep uh, frustrations, I think, among journalists and, and among activists is that these attacks happen, and there's a failure to prevent them when they take place um, at, the, at the hands of third parties, right? And there's a lack of accountability. There's virtual impunity for physical attacks and other kinds of attacks on journalists today. This is um, Daphne... Uh, Caruanza Galizia, who was a blogger and reporter uh, in Malta, who was killed. She was really a corruption reporter. And actually, uh, as a footnote, corruption is, the, is really the issue that gets one most in trouble around the world these days, outside of places like, like Turkey or China or Egypt. Um, really, corruption reporting is what puts you uh, in, in the sights of, of those with power and, and Daphne was covering these issues, and she was killed by a car bomb right in front of her home um, right after a series of important reporting about corruption in Malta. The last thing I'll mention in terms of the overall attack is the redefinition of law, right? So it used to be that we would have Article 19, for example, transposed into domestic law, and the norms of Article 19 would simply be the governing norms. Governments wouldn't necessarily abide by them, um, but those would be the governing norms. We've seen over the last several years essentially a redefinition of law, right? We've seen a redefinition, for example, of journalism, and this is true in Turkey, where most of the uh, individuals who have been put in prison in Turkey who are, who are prosecuted are being prosecuted under um, basically anti-terrorism laws, right? So they're being accused of being terrorists for their reporting, you're reporting on the Kurds. You're reporting on, um, on, on maybe Turkish activity in Syria. You're a terrorist, or you are promoting terrorism. That's a redefinition of how we think about terrorism and how we think about law. We see this in a number of other spaces as well. So this is the backdrop in terms of the context that we see around the world, direct attacks on freedom of expression. We also see the criminalization of the dissemination of information. So these are just a few examples of many where disinformation is criminalized, right? And people go to prison for merely reporting. 
Okay, so let me say a few words about the rise of digital space and the opportunities in that space where governments really find opportunities uh, for, for abuse. So I think when we, th when we start to think about digital space, I do think we need to think about the, the fact that internet access has become essential to freedom of expression today. Whether that means access to the internet is a human right or something else like that, it's pretty clear that around the world, if you want to participate in public debates, if you want to have your voice heard by others, you need to be online. So that's, that's a kind of foundational feature of the digital age right now. It isn't enough, really, for society to provide you, you know, a soapbox in a park so that you can go up and, and make, your, make your statement. You also, that soapbox now has to be a digital one. You have to have that space. And governments realize that, and these are some of the things that they're doing in order to restrict expression online. So one is that they're shutting down the Internet. This is, uh, so this is from Access Now, which has a campaign um, called Keep It On. The hashtag is Keep It On. Around the world, we see governments, sometimes in as mundane circumstances as, um, uh, as national high school exams, shutting down the Internet to, preventing, to prevent cheating. Um, we've seen that in, in Uganda. We've seen that uh, in Pakistan. We've seen that in several other places. But more regularly, the real serious concerns are when there's public protest or there's mass reporting of some significant malfeasance by government um, that the Internet will be shut down. So this happens um, in, the, in a number of places. It is a, an epidemic, in a way, in India. It's happened in Tajikistan. It's happened in any number of places. And you can see that in 2018, um, there were almost 200 Internet shutdowns around the world that, that were not simply Internet outages, but they were specifically demanded by government to shut down the Internet. Obviously, in a particular context of, say, uh, mass terrorism, you could imagine an argument that shutting down the Internet for some period of time might meet principles of, of necessity. The problem is meeting principles of proportionality, right, and also meeting principles of legitimate use of those kinds of tools. A second kind of issue that we need to think about is government surveillance and government hacking. So this is a picture of um, GCHQ. This is um, the Center for British Intelligence. Um, and I think in the discussion, you know, we can talk about bad actors out there who are restricting expression, who are targeting journalists, but this also requires us to think about our own societies and what we might be doing, and government surveillance and hacking is something done by the so-called Five Eyes Intelligence Cooperatives, right? That's the United States and, and its allies who share intelligence and also share in the kind of work that they do to attack um, activists, sometimes put to good use, perhaps, um, but through a process of opacity that's very hard to know what governments are doing in our names in order to um, interfere with privacy, sometimes on a mass scale. Then we've also had the rise of the surveillance industry. So I mentioned uh, Carmen Aristegui at the beginning. So she's just one example of many, many people around the world who've been subject to the new, this rise of private surveillance companies who are able to sell their software around the world virtually without any kind of constraint. There's very little law that governs the transfer of software, whether it's from British or Italian or Israeli or any number of other actors um, who are selling their products, and not just selling their products, oftentimes they're servicing them over time, so they're providing support, for example, to, um, to Saudi Arabia in, in the Saudi government's efforts to track journalists uh, such as Jamal Khashoggi or his friends. Um, and there is very clear evidence that NSO group, that is the Israeli group here, provided software to the Saudis that, um, that probably led to the tracking of Jamal Khashoggi and may have been, although we don't know, but may have been a factor um, in identifying where he would be and carrying out his murder. So this private surveillance industry is a subject of real serious concern around the world. It's a real serious concern of Citizen Lab here in Canada, and it's something that I'll turn to in a moment when I talk about some of the legal issues that we might think about and sort of reconceptualizing 
law for a world in which private actors have so much power over our freedom of opinion and freedom of expression. One of the things, I want to give one more example in addition to the example of Carmen, um, and an example of how law can be unavailable to, to many people who are targeted by these kinds of tools. So um, a few years ago, um, in Ethiopia, um, it, through its, its government, um, targeted an activist, several activists, um, who lived outside of Ethiopia, and one of those activists lived in Maryland. Um, he goes by, um, by a pseudonym, we'll call him Kidane, but Kidane, Mr. Kidane, was subject to targeting by Ethiopia, and his computer was infected with a malware that allowed the Ethiopian government to track all of his emails, to, um, to log, to do a key log, so they could track actually what he was typing, it could track who he was communicating with, it could track all sorts of people who were within his circle of activism, both in the United States, because he, had, he was already in, uh, in Maryland, in the US, um, but also with people who he was communicating with in Ethiopia, right? So Citizen Lab actually was the organization that, that figured out that he had malware installed, that is, software that could infect his computer and send messages back to Ethiopia. Citizen Lab figured this out. Um, the Electronic Frontier Foundation sued the government of Ethiopia in federal court in the United States. Um, and they sued on grounds of privacy violations, uh, wiretap act violations, and so forth. And on the merits, these were very strong claims. There was one problem. It's very difficult to sue a foreign government, whether in the United States or anywhere else. So the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act was interpreted by the Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia as um, forbidding Mr. Kadane from suing the government of Ethiopia. That is even though this was quite obviously not a commercial tort, it didn't fall into, um, I mean, it should have fallen into one of the exceptions that would have allowed a suit against a foreign government in this context. But it wasn't interpreted that way. And it suggests one of the barriers, not just to uh, litigation in the United States, but litigation worldwide, because not every government has a Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, and this will serve as a kind of customary norm that other governments might look to and, um, and essentially disable individuals who suffer some sort of damage or some harm from suing those who are responsible for that. This is just to show where Pegasus software, that is the NSO group software, has been identified as infecting activists, journalists, and others around the world. And that is, you can see, from North America to South America to the Middle East to Central Asia, South Asia, and Europe. Right? It is, if you look at it this way in terms of a map, it looks like a pandemic almost. And, and in many respects, it is. It's a pandemic without, without much control over it. The last sort of set of, um, of digital attacks that I just want to highlight is something also that I mentioned at the beginning, and that was the role that social media can play in all of this. So because social media provides such an open platform for journalists and activists and others, dissidents, opposition figures, um, supporters of government as well, um, it's become a very um, obvious target for governments to seek to restrict expression. Now, this shows legal requests made by governments to Twitter from January to June of 2018. Some of those requests are made through normal legal channels, that is, they go through the courts, um, but that's a very small percentage. If you look at some of the numbers here, and you might not be able to see them, I put Turkey up on top in honor of uh, Denise and Bessel here, but you can see Turkey is in the lead in terms of making requests. 8,480 legal demands made to Twitter to take down particular content, to take down accounts, and so forth. Only 508 of those involve court orders, or 500, 508 additional um, legal demands were made by court orders. To its credit, um, Twitter only withheld 18%, but one of the problems with this is that we have very little transparency as to the nature of even those takedowns. Were they because they, in, they were in violation of Twitter's rules because they involved hate speech, incitement to hate. Um, was it because they involved privacy violations? We just don't, don't really know. But if you go to Twitter's 
uh, transparency page, you can see all of the places around the world. If you have a particular interest in any government, you can see how that government seeks to really restrict expression, expression um, on, on social platforms. And here you can just see the more specific numbers uh, related to Turkey. Okay, so that presents, I think, a, um, a fairly grim view of freedom of expression around the world. And my fear is that it's only getting worse. And it's getting worse in many respects because we don't really have the legal tools to restrict it. And at the same time, governments don't seem willing to adopt those legal tools in order to um, constrain the use of these very, very serious attacks on freedom of opinion and freedom of expression. So I want to give um, just a, a set of suggestions where we should be thinking about developing law. So th these are areas where we have the foundation of international human rights law, um, but we need to go further in order to develop real tools that apply both to states and to private industry in order to constrain the use of them. So in thinking about states, I think fundamentally states need to see digital attacks as a fundamental threat to civil society, and they need to retool law in response. Right? So it's one thing for us to think about sort of the top-line, high-profile cases of arrests and killings of journalists as a key thing to be dealt with, to, be re to which governments and civil society should be responding. And absolutely, we should put that as a top priority. But at the same time, we should think about these other kinds of threats, which are really grave threats that are seeking to undermine our public space and are seeking to undermine our public debate, that we should be conceptual conceptualizing those kinds of threats as very serious ones as well that deserve legal attention. Um, and so I would say just a few things that I would put up here. Of course, obviously, governments, starting with Turkey, should adhere to their human rights obligations. There's no question about that. That would mean, in the case of Turkey, for example, not just releasing all of those individuals, um, which ranges into the hundreds, um, if not thousands, of people who are detained in prisons like Silivri, um, uh, who are detained for the reason of their expression, right? Whether it's what they were searching, whether it was the tool that they were using to express themselves and to have some privacy or whatnot, Turkey needs to adhere to its human rights ob obligations, and that's true for all states. When it comes to digital tools and it comes to this, the private surveillance industry and its sharing of its, of its tools worldwide, there needs to be disclosure. Governments that purchase them need to disclose it. There needs to be transparency around that, and they need to disclose when they're using these tools. It's fundamentally important to individuals in these states to know what tools their governments have in order to do, whether it's criminal law enforcement or counterterrorism, or to use them in nefarious ways, like I've described here. There is a non-binding arrangement for the export of what are known as dual-use items. So it can be high-tech, it could be weaponry, and all sorts of, of other kinds of tools that have very legitimate uses. It's called the Vassenar arrangement. It has very, very weak um, set of constraints on the sharing of software, as, as, as I've been talking about here. So the Vassenar arrangement, at least as a non-binding tool, needs to be re-energized and updated for the digital age, which it, it has hardly been uh, updated at all. There's also a tremendous revolving door between those who are in the intelligence services, and then they go out to start these new companies that are based on some of the software that they've used um, at this very high level, whether it's through the NSA, and there was a big report um, by Reuters about six weeks ago that you could look up that deals exactly with this, this particular problem. But you also see it in the context of the NSO group in Israel, where those who were in the Israeli intelligence services then go, went and started NSO group, and they used their tools to, to supply actors around the world. Again, sometimes potentially for good use, right, for counterterrorism, uh, for law enforcement purposes, but it's the nefarious use that we're worried about, and in order to understand what is being used and how it's being used, we need more transparency around that, and we need transparency around who is moving from place to place. And then the last thing I would mention is that states really need to um, reconceptualize the restrictions on litigation at a, at a national level. 
right? So that means in the context of state immunity from litigation, from, from suit, that there should be really more nuanced consideration of, um, of who can be sued or what can be sued and under what circumstances. Okay, so let me talk also about the private sector for a minute, as I've got just a few minutes left. So I think the private sector also needs to see their responsibility as a facilitator of these attacks on, on civil society. And they need to retool their own policies and practices in response. And the first thing is that they need to um, implement the UN guiding principles. So this is something that I haven't talked about at all. The UN guiding principles, which were adopted in 2013 by the Human Rights Council and were developed over a series of, of a few years by Professor John Ruggie, who's now at Harvard, um, developed a kind of a set of what you see here, principles and pillars upon which companies can be held responsible um, for, their resp for their role in um, impacting the rights of individuals. Now, this isn't made just for digital space, right? So this we could think of, if you're thinking about conflict minerals, for example, or any other way in which um, companies might impact human rights, the UN Guiding Principles gives us a kind of framework for thinking about that, right? So one is that states have a duty to protect. The second is that companies have a responsibility to respect. And the third is that there should be a remedy for a violation. So what does it mean for a company to um, have a responsibility to respect? I'll just mention a few. And I urge you, if you're not familiar with the UN Guiding Principles, to go take a look at them. They're very clear, and they provide examples of what companies can do. And th this is... This is a voluntary framework. This is not something that is, at least at this point, uh, founded in law, right, in least binding law on the companies. But there are some things that companies can do in order to minimize their impact or ameliorate their impact on, on civil society and on individual rights. So that means I have a minute. My, my, I said it for a minute early, to, and now I'm, now I'm wasting seconds. So one is the company should adopt human rights policies at a very high level, right, so they should basically encourage throughout their, their entire companies that there's a, a mindfulness about the impact that their products might have on individual users and on the public. There should be human rights due diligence. So there should be impact assessments by the companies as to what exactly their products do in their particular environments, in the markets where they're, where they're operating. There should be full disclosure of policy implementation as well. And then finally, just a few other kind of random things that, that we, particularly as civil society, should be thinking of. One is, over the last several years, um, really since early in the, the second Iraq war, there's been an emerging regulation of private military contractors. This has been a set of soft law um, issues that we can think of, a set of principles, might provide us with some basis for thinking about the private surveillance industry as well. We should think about, as civil society, modes of litigation, we're not always going to be able to sue states, but are companies going to be susceptible to litigation? What are the theories under which um, private companies might be, might be um, litigated against? And then finally, I think it's critical for all of us to be raising these issues at the level of global human rights uh, mechanisms. So that means the political bodies like the Human Rights Council, treaty bodies like the Human Rights Committee, um, regional human rights courts. There are many places in which we can do this kind of advocacy. They can develop a normative framework that eventually can go and change state behavior, which ultimately is what we're thinking about, is, should be our aim, and also change company b behavior and force companies to think about the costs of their, um, of their activities. And I will end there, I think, almost within 35 minutes, as, as requested. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for, the, uh, for providing us with uh, conceptual clarity as well as a practical roadmap of what to do. Um, I will ask now the family therapist of Denise to come and provide us with <laughs> a few Thank comments on his role. Uh, I'm sorry first for my English, please. <laughs> uh, I hope you will understand my speech. Uh, dear friends, having been Denis Ujjal's lawyer during uh, his unjust persecution and imprisonment, I can say that 
we could never imagine a day such as uh, this where we would be addressing a warm edu such as yourself. I would first like to thank McKinney University for honoring uh, the important work of Denise and all of the Turkey silence journalists with the Robert Slipwell Award and Mr. K and all speakers for their thoughtful remarks and congratulations. Tebrikler. Again, more, one more time for this well-deserved award. To highlight the meaning of this award, I would like to offer a current snapshot of Turkey, our country which has been brutal to journalists, lawyers, activists, writers, and others who have dared express their opinions of late. The truth is, tur to, to, the truth is Turkey has, is, has never uh, had an independent or important judiciary. Uh, journalists have never been free during its republic history. The judiciary and imprisonment have always been the weapon of choice of Turkish state has used against journalists. Until the 2000s, the Kemalist elite was dominated uh, the country, uh, which in the middle of 2000s, they lost their power to people close the Gülen movement. After 2012, openly pro-government judges and prosecutors dominated the judiciary system. But what has changed after coup attempt of 2060? The judiciary, was, which has traditionally uh, suppressed the Kurdish intellectuals and journalists, writers who researched the, of the Armenian genocide, or left-wing critics or, and opponents or intellectuals of the Alevi communities, turned it all segment of Turkey. The country was serious of extrajudicial uh, murders of Kurdish journalists and socialist intellectuals in addition to many others of the same background being prosecuted uh, at the hand of the judiciary. But at, that, uh, but at the time, we still could come across decision from courts that sided with freedom of speech. Since the coup attempt, the judiciary now openly oppresses and punishes all segments of Turkey civil society. We longer can say there are obst uh, obstacles in the way of freedom of speech in Turkey because now we are at the point where freedom of speech no longer exists in Turkey in any shape or form. Uh, the Turkish constitution adopted after 1982 coup uh, is a creation of military regime, but still it allows the four free speech rights to intellectuals and journalists. However, Turkish courts don't apply these rules. The Constitution and the European Convention on Human Rights, which uh, supersize domestic law in Turkey, are openly ignored by judiciary. The already weak link between rule of law and judiciary that was in pl uh, place before the coup attempt has broken off completely. Now we are faced with a system that doesn't even pretend to obey its uh, own laws, Turkey is no longer a country with a rule, rule, rule of law, but is it also no longer even country with rule by law. The judiciary is no longer part of the problem, <coughs> but it has become the main problem. In closing, I would like to note against the, the Jirim background, Turkey still has journalists, lawyers, who write freelancely like Denise and academics and activists, who continue to speak what they know to be true. Although fragmented and heavily suppressed, it still has a strong opposition and civil society ready to fight no matter at, was, at what cost. Of course, this is not something you don't know. Honoring Denise today is an open recognition and celebration in this fact. I would like to say thank you again for taking me uh, from your busy day to be the, here with us today, and we know that your support for us and for the silence in Turkey will continue. Thank you very much. Um, in all our name, I would like to uh, thank all the panelists for um, their presentations. I think they have strengthened our resolve to continue fighting for human rights and the rule of law. They have given us practical examples from the past. They have given us tools for the future. Um, and we have to continue to reflect on that. And we have to continue to interact with people who have suffered, with people who are now fighting on the ground, 
and with people who uh, are ready to work with everyone in order to protect human rights and, and strengthen the rule of law. So thank you very much. This was a very inspiring moment for all of us. Hello.